this morning. Amen. Y'all ready to hear the word of the Lord? Praise God. Well, let's go to uh, turn in your Bibles with me. We're going to go ahead and read a passage out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to kind of make mention of a couple of little things as we go through because I don't really have any of my notes. But verse 1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. Now, I've got to tell you that what he's talking about, the overall context of this particular passage that we're going to be preaching from, when he's talking about this ministry, he's talking about being entrusted with communicating the eternal word of the gospel. He's talking about the fact that it's been given to him, to, and it's a requirement upon his life, really. I mean, the truth is, and nah, I want to be careful, I don't go too far with it, but the truth is, is that a, the calling of God is the calling of God. You, I'm telling you right now, anybody that's ever been called to the Lord to preach the gospel, they weren't necessarily looking for it, they, they weren't necessarily expecting it. When you've been called by the Holy Spirit, it's a God thing. I mean, this isn't a job, this isn't, you work, I mean, don't get me wrong, it is a job, it requires a lot of work, but this isn't some kind of thing where you fill out a resume and you upgrade your position, people try to do that, but what I'm trying to say is, is that the calling of God is a calling of the Holy Spirit, and there's a compulsion that is connected to a true calling of God, where you are pressed, like we talked about in the book of Acts, where you have an overwhelming compulsion that you have to speak the truth, and to and to do this ministry, and, and in the Apostle Paul's eyes, there was nothing more important, there was nothing that, that was more of a blessing than to have been given this ministry. Right. And he said, as we have received mercy, we've received mercy and we faint not. We're not going to grow weary. No matter what it is that we go through by the grace of God, we're not going to grow weary. He says, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now, what I want you to know is, is this. Now, the Apostle Paul is a character uh, has lived his life with such a character that each and every one of us should be paying close attention, amen, how he walked with the Lord. But when it talks specifically right here about not having hidden things in the life or, or, or not handling things with dishonesty or not walking in craftiness, do you know what he's talking about specifically right there? He's talking about the presentation of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. The context is directly related to the way that the Word of God is handled. What is your point? Well, we're about to get to it here in a second, and I don't want to get ahead of myself. Not every man of God that stands behind the pulpit operates the way that the Apostle Paul is talking about. Many times, listen, there's many times people who minister the Word of God don't even realize it, but they are handling the Word with with craftiness and dishonesty. Well, how could a person handle the word of God with craftiness? What is the word crafty? Wily, deceit, okay, kind of like wily coyote. Remember the old roadrunner day set the trap for roadrunner? The Word of God says that in the book of Ephesians, sleight of hand, talking about preachers, sleight of hand. The word there is cubia, where we get the word cube or dice. It's kind of like, or you remember that game on the street where they take the little cup and they put, okay, which one's it under? Which one's it under? And what's really going on there is that people are manipulating the scriptures in such a way, they put a little twist on it, that the people, it sounds like it's the Word of God. Listen to me, I'm not talking about something that just took place during the Apostle Paul's time. I'm talking about something that is alive and well today in the modern church right. and that men con mankind listen every last one of us if we're honest with one another sometimes we can see motivations in our heart that are not right and the man that stands behind the pulpit is not uh so it's not impossible for him to find himself in a place where he Twist the word of God. And once again, I'm trying to tell you, he doesn't even always know he's doing it. Well, how can that be? Because 
he learned from his father before him. I'm not talking about his daddy. Right. I'm talking about his father in the faith. He mm -hmm. learned from his father before him, who learned from his father before him, who learned from his father before him, who learned from his father. What's the point are you making? I'm talking about the traditions of men. Mm -hmm. The word of God talks about the traditions of men. It says in 1 Peter 1.18, you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold, which you received from the vain traditions of your fathers. Empty tradition. Listen, this has been alive in the church. I have sat under this. And the people that were teaching me weren't purposefully trying to deceive me. They loved God. I believe they had a genuine call of God on their life. But listen to me. We're going to get into it in the scriptures. The devil is alive and real. He's alive and well. And he's good at what he does. Oh, let me tell you something. He was right there when Pontius Pilate washed his hands. He was here long before all of that. He's been observing human behavior for thousands of years. And he has been slowly creeping and wiggling his way into the church. If you think the enemy's not in churches, come on, somebody. Help me out here. No, the enemy's in churches. The enemy stands behind pulpits and he handles the word of God with craftiness and deceit yeah. to the point where it sounds good because it's painted with yep. scripture, but it is not the right context of the scripture. And we wonder why the church is in such a mess. And we wonder why the people of God are in such a mess. And it's because we're not being communicated properly the word of the Lord. Lord, please help us. Help us to have it. Help me, Lord. Help anybody that stands behind this pulpit, Lord. To have a desire to not handle the word of God with crafty. And see, I don't know how God talks to you, but I'm just telling you, I don't know if it's because of the way my daddy, I don't know why God talks to me like this, but sometimes God said, and I know I've shared this with you before. One time I'm telling you, the Lord told me, you keep your grubby little fingers out of my word, son. What he meant was, don't you manipulate my word. Don't you play games with my, you let my word preach to my people. I got all kinds of scriptures up in this message and it's going to speak. You know what I think? You know what that word, that's a personal pronoun. My people. You know what the Lord showed me? You, you, sometimes pastors are confused. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the people are confused. Yeah. They want to elevate the man of God and put him on some kind of a pedestal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Listen to me. There's always a place for respect, but the word of God talks about the fact that we're supposed to respect one another. Yeah. Right. When you get a revelation of what the cross teaches you, that yourself must die so that he might live. Yeah. It teaches us to become humble, yeah. amen, so that he can be exalted. Don't be elevating the man of God because the man of God is a man. Amen. But the reality of it is, is this. We're all supposed to live according to the word of God and to live our lives in such a way that we're circumspectly walking before the Lord. Amen. The apostle Paul says we're not going to live in, in a hidden way with the word of God. We're not going to handle this word with craftiness or dishonesty. But instead, we're going to manifest the truth. We commend ourselves to every man's conscience, conscience in the sight of God. Verse 3, believe this. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. I got all kind of scripture for you on that. Lord, help us. In whom, look at this, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds. And I want to, I want to bring this out a little bit. And them which believe not. Because it's not just them which believe not. Now, this, what I'm trying to say is it's not just for unbelievers. No. The God of this world has blinded the minds of people that are also in the church. Right. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of different levels to believing. You understand what I'm saying? There's many people that I know that have heard the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sin and have come to the realization and revelation that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. And they said, Lord, yes, I accept you as my Savior. And guess what? According to the Word of God, they believed in their heart and they confessed with their mouth and they are saved. And the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of their heart. But listen, I'm going to get into it a little bit deeper here this morning. We're going to talk about the gospel and how it is that you are to properly walk with the Lord. And listen, the enemy wants, the first thing he wants you to do is not get saved. You, you get that, right? The enemy does not want you saved. The enemy doesn't want your neighbor saved. The enemy doesn't want your children saved. The enemy wants to destroy 
your soul. The enemy wants people to go to hell for eternity with him. This is the, this is the reality of the word of God. The enemy, Satan, tried to usurp God's authority and he was cast. Jesus said, I saw him fall from, the, from heaven like lightning to the ground. The scripture says that the dragon pulled a third of the stars down with him. A third of the angels threw their lot in with Satan. And now, let me tell you, I had a conversation one time with John Collier, a close friend of mine, and I can remember we were talking about the bloodthirstiness of fallen angels. The bloodthirstiness of demon spirits and how they desire. Can you imagine how angry, how bitter the forces of evil must be to have seen the glory of God. Celestial creations that were in the presence of the holy God. They were there with him. They worshipped him. And then they bought into a lie. He was created. Satan was created perfect in all his ways until pride was found in him. And then he was cast to the earth. And, the, and, the, and, the, and a third of the angels fell with him. And now they can't come back. There's no redemption for them. The word of God says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus condescended. He came down and in the Greek the idea is, is he bypassed the angels because he didn't come to redeem fallen angels. Fallen angels can't be redeemed. Demon spirits can't be redeemed. Jesus came to redeem Adam's seed. Jesus came to redeem the human race and they know it. And the Bible says that angels peer. It's like they stand on the precipice of heaven and they look at this thing called salvation and it's like they're amazed by it is what the word of God says. And every time a soul gets saved, listen to me, I know you, I know you were, you were all, you were good when you were a young child and even in your teenage years, you were good and you didn't make mistakes like the preacher did. But hey, let me tell you something. When the angels saw Matt Aether get saved on that day, they were like, oh, Lord, how does it make sense? And when they saw that even after he got saved, he made mistakes, and God would still have mercy on his soul. They're just confounded and they're confused because you know why? They can't. They see their brother, their brethren. They see their fallen Brethren, if you let, would let me say it like that. There's none of this is in my notes. This is just what the Lord wants to tell you this morning. They see their fallen creation, their celestial brothers, if you would permit me to say it like that. And they can't come back. There's no coming back. And they're angry and they're bitter and they're bloodthirsty. And they're going to do everything that they can to drag as many human beings with them into the pit of hell. Let me tell you something. That's what the word of God says. Preachers today don't want to talk about it because it makes people feel funny. Well, guess what? They're going to feel real funny if nobody tells the truth and we end up in the wrong place. Lord, help us when there was this glorious gospel that saved yes. us. Amen. Amen. That's the first thing. The enemy wants our soul to be damned. But listen, if you gave your heart to Jesus and the Holy Ghost lives in your heart, that's not the story anymore. That's not your story. Your name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life and the enemy's going to try to convince you otherwise, but he's a liar and the father of lies. He speaks one language. It's, uh, I call it Lyonese. That's all he knows how to speak. He's a liar. But the next thing that he wants to do is he wants to keep you in bondage. Oh, he wants to bind you up. That's what I'm talking about. This other part of the gospel. We're about to talk to you about it this morning. He wants to bind you up. He wants to keep you in chains. He doesn't want you to be free and liberated to tell those that he brings in your path the good news of Jesus Christ. God is love and he wants to communicate his love to a lost and a dying world. Amen. The God of this world has blinded them that don't believe. Not just that they don't believe that Jesus died for them. There's a whole lot of them out there. But let me tell you something. There's a whole lot of people in the church that don't believe that the way to victory is simple faith in what Jesus has already done. Oh, they working, dude. Look, don't get me wrong. I believe in working for the Lord. Don't tell me I don't believe in working for the Lord. I work for the Lord. You don't know what I do. I'm not going to sit up here and announce everything I do. It gets weird. You start like you're patting yourself on the back. It ain't about that. I work for the Lord. Amen. I believe in work. I work harder for the Lord now than I ever worked before. 
But what I'm trying to say is you can't work your way into a right standing with God. And for the longest time in my walk with God, I thought that that's how I was going to be right with God. I needed to do more. I needed to do, I needed to read more. I needed to, and don't, I'm not telling you don't read, and I'm not telling you don't pray, and I'm not telling you don't come to church. I'm trying to tell you it's the motivation. I'm just talking to you right now. It's the motives of the heart, and it's the thought, the thinking of the mind. And the mind starts to look at what self does. Come on. It's called self-righteousness. And this is how I preach. And I'm going to continue. I'm not going to handle the word craftily or with deceit. I'm just going to tell you, hey, man, how the Lord gives it to me. And this is how it comes out of me. Amen. Amen. It comes out of me real, just real frank. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that there's a spirit of self-righteousness in every believer. You don't have to like that if you don't want it. But the quicker we come to terms with it, the better off we will be. Because self-righteousness is the opposite of true righteousness. True righteousness is a gift given by Jesus that's laid upon you like a garment. You couldn't earn it. He had to die for it. God, the Father, uh, released the most precious object in heaven and sent him upon this earth for him to be humiliated. The King of kings and the Lord of lords humiliated, stripped naked, beaten and cursed and ridiculed and hung on a cross as he was suspended between heaven and the earth all because of you, all because of me. No, if you could have earned something, brothers and sisters, all that would not have had to happen. Amen. No, you couldn't earn nothing. I, I'm talking with as far as righteousness goes. You ain't going to earn no standing with the Lord like that. As a matter of fact, you know what the Lord revealed to me one time? Whenever, they, whenever Jesus was baptized, it said he went under the water, the heavens opened, Voice from heaven said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the spirit of God, like a dove, descended upon him. And when, once again, I don't know how God speaks to you. I'm just telling you how God speaks to me. He knows how to get my attention. He says, I'm not well pleased with Matt. I know that that would probably hurt a lot of people's feelings. But then he quickly followed it up. I'm well pleased with him. See, this is my plan. He's my plan. You choose my plan. Now I can be well pleased with you because now you're found within the beloved. I'm no longer looking at you and your faults and your failures. I'm looking through the eyes of the blood. I'm looking at you through him. You're now seated in Christ. That's the gospel. That's, that's the word of God. You're in him. You're in Christ. 170 times it says that in the New Testament. Prepositional phrase. I don't know. Do I have a piece of chalk left? I know I do it all the time, but y'all bear with me. Here it is. Prepositional phrase. In Christ. In Him. In whom. At least one variant of these is used at least 170 times. I heard a preacher say that one time. I started to count when I got to about 110, I quit. <laughs> Point being is this. It's throughout the New Testament. What does it mean? It's describing a new position. Yes. Amen. See, the first time you were born in Adam, you weren't in Christ. Does that make sense what I'm trying to tell you? You were in Adam. Come on. Your first physical birth, you were born in Adam. You were born in sin. You were born bound by sin. You had a compulsion to go towards things that were unholy. There was something stronger than you. I'm about to talk to you about the liberty of the gospel and how the gospel will set you free. And even though the God of this world wants to blind the eyes of the world out there and the people in here, he can't have his way because the word of God says, hallelujah, you're in him. You're in Christ. And in there, you've received a gift called righteousness. And because you've received that gift, I'm preaching ahead of myself, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Now you're not on this on your own. You're not just hunkering down and trying to get through. You're not just trying to work your way into the presence of God. No, you're in the presence of God because you're in the darling of heaven and in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. How in the world is the enemy of our soul going to stand in the presence of God? He don't want none of that. Listen to me. The New Testament was clear. Whenever the demon saw him, oh, Jesus of Nazareth, you're here before the appointed time. You're not supposed to be doing all this yet. He took authority over them. In the swine, you bunch of liars. You don't have authority here. Jesus said that he, he said,
said that he came to bind the strong man. What Jesus did on the cross, listen to me, the re revelation of that. What Jesus did at the cross, the result of that spiritually binds the power of the strong man. You know, you remember that story in the, in the, in the gospel? Jesus said, I think it's Matthew 12. When he, when he rebuked, he, he cast the devil out of that man. He was mute. He cast the devil out of that man. What did the Pharisees say? Oh, he cast out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. <laughs> because they ain't never seen power like that. Never. Jesus said, nay, but if I cast out devils by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Amen. See, Jesus, the kingdom of God, all his power was resident in him. He said, and no man can, spo can take the spoil a man's goods lest he first bind the strong man. It might seem like a kind of a funny Illustration. Well, I mean, why is Jesus talking about breaking in and robbing somebody's house? The scripture clearly states that Satan is the prince of this evil age. Jesus called him the prince three times. I didn't make that up. It's in the Bible. Read it. Called him the prince three times. I mean, the word prince there is archon. It means chief leader. Satan don't own this earth. Oh, don't, don't you try to put words in this preacher's mouth. That ain't what I'm saying. No, no, no. This earth belongs to God. This earth was give, created by God for man as a habitable place for him to live in. Come on, somebody, help me out. Before he ever created man, he had already created dirt. He had already created plant life. He had already created water so he could have photosynthesis, so that there could be animals, so that life could be sustained, so that man could have a place to live, so that man could choose to live with God. Amen. Amen. Then he put a tree in the midst. So that man will make a choice. Yes. Yes. And from that day, moving forward, man has had to make a choice. You either choose God or you're not. What I'm trying to say, though, is this is that in man's choice to go his own way. And this goes for you each and every day of your life. It goes for the preacher, too. Yes. In man's choice to go his own way, what he did was he opened up doors. And has given Satan liberty to have power in people's lives. I, am I speaking the truth this morning? Yeah. Yeah. Satan has power in people. Satan has power. He's not supposed to. I'm just, I'm just talking real to you. Satan has power in people's lives that are in the church. Not supposed to. <laughs> but the reason why is, is because we allow him to. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that Jesus took authority over him and he came to bind the strong man. This isn't in my notes, but if you would go to Colossians chapter 2. I hadn't even finished reading the passage yet. Lord, you're in control. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. I love this passage of scripture. I'm talking about Jesus binding the strong man. I'm talking about Jesus, it's a fancy word, procuring victory for the human race. In other words, he purchased it. He took it for us. Amen. Amen. He, gave, he bought it and he gave it to us. Amen. Praise God. Believe this. Blighting, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What that's talking about is the law. Did you know that the law was against you? I used to, you know, like I like country folk. I just like the way they talk. And sometimes they say that he, he, it was against us. Some of you ever had anybody again you? <laughs> the law was against you. Why? Because you were guilty. I was guilty. And ain't none of us kept the law. I don't care how holy you think you are. You ain't never kept the law. There's only one that ever kept the law. His name's Jesus. Amen. Because listen, even if you even if you never killed, even if you never cheated, committed adultery, even if you never lied, come on somebody, please. Even if you never did any of that, at some point in time you coveted somebody else's stuff. You either coveted somebody else's woman or man, or you coveted somebody's goods. And it's, that's a motivation thing that nobody else can see. It's only right. deep down on the inside of you. And if you're honest with the Lord, you know it's happened. Come on. The law was against you. But look what he did. He... He blotted, he blotted it out. And look what it says. The law was contrary to us. And look at this. He took it, the law, out of the way. How did he do that? He nailed it to his cross. Oh, I ain't even got started yet. Don't tell me that the gospel's not all, all wrapped up in the cross of Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about for salvation. I want to make that clear today. You know what? I'm going to write it on the board so that you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. When I say cross... Today, I'm not 
talking just about initial salvation? No. <laughs> I'm talking about how you daily walk with God. Now, yeah. listen to me. I'm going to prove it in the scripture. I, I'm not going to sit up here and just espouse a bunch of things to you. I'm going to prove it to you in the scripture. Amen? But look, let's just go right here. What did he do? The law was contrary to you because you were guilty of it, but the Lord removed it. He blotted out that problem. He took it out of the way. How did he do it? Because he nailed it to his cross. You know what the whole essence behind this is? Mankind was guilty. God gave his law to show mankind the difference of, between his holiness and guilt. Mankind, incapable of keeping the law, was guilty also within the law. Jesus came, kept the law, died in our place, paying the penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Next verse. Look at this. This, this is the beauty part. Having spoiled principalities and powers... He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Do you see that word it right there? What is it referring to? What was the last noun that was used? Go back to the previous verse. What did he do? He, nailed, he took that which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way. He nailed it to his cross. Next verse. He spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly. You know what that means? It's kind of like, I know that this maybe is a bad illustration, but if you could imagine like a teen, it's, it's not good to be cocky like this, but I'm just saying like some of the times whenever we were young and we played sports, if we beat somebody really bad, even I remember, <laughs> I remember whenever <clears throat> Aaron played from Morgan City High, they went to the semifinals in the state for basketball. And I can remember one of the times I went to one of the games, and at the end, the whole crowd of Morgan City started singing this song. Na, 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 hey, 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 goodbye. They were clowning them because they just got whooped, and it just got it handed to them. And so now it's like, let's pour it on. Okay, we know that that's the wrong attitude. But what this is saying right here is that he made an open spectacle of you remember those fallen angels I was talking about earlier? Remember those demon spirits I was talking about earlier that are bloodthirsty and want to destroy you? Jesus made an open spectacle of them because he defeated them. He, he gained power over them for the human race. He already had power over them. The kingdom of God was already resident in them. He said, get out. I've come to bind the strong man. But the question is, how's he going to get that power to you and I so that we can start to walk in victory so that we can so because you and I need to learn dependence, Amen. not self-righteousness, not self-aggrandizement, not lifting up self. Oh, I'm the Holy One of Israel. Oh, you ought to see me. Come on. Look, just don't get offended. Don't, look, don't feel like I'm poking in your eyeball. Just work with me. Work with me because we've all been there if we're honest with one another. I can remember when I used to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, man. I'm like, dude, I, I, I'm telling you, I'm being honest with you, what I thought for a moment in time. I'm the darling of heaven, man. Ain't nobody else getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning seeking the Lord like me. Oh, no. They, don't, they ain't reading the scriptures like me, but they're not memorizing the scriptures like me. Like, I'll show you. I'm about to whip it out on somebody right here. Boom, 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 boom. Look at that, boy. I can quote some scripture on you and befuddle your mind. Make your eyes get crossed. The self-righteousness. Pride of, of religion. Sin. He's trying to look like the enemy now, but the Lord had to reveal that to me. You got the heart of Cain. You, you think you're better than what you are. No man ought not think more highly of himself than what he ought. No, you ain't the darling of heaven. He's the darling of heaven. And listen, you ain't doing everything right, son. He did everything right. You need to lower yourself. You need to humble yourself so that I can elevate you, so that I can use you the way I want to use you. This is all part of my message. It's just all out of order. <laughs> Praise God. Flow, Lord. Flow like a river. Amen? Look. It goes on to say, let's go back to verse 4. So listen. Ultimately, the scripture I wanted to show you right there was, is that Jesus made an open spectacle of those lying devils. 
He triumphed yes. over them through the cross. Yes. It was at Calvary yes. that he yes. gave us victory. Amen? Amen? It was what he did at the cross Amen. that did it. All right? Now, the result is his faith in him and what he did at the cross, that humble position on our part, realizing that there's nothing that we can do to gain the victory. No, the victory's already out. Now listen to me. As you read, as you fast, as you seek the face of God, it's going to give you deeper revelation of who yeah. He is, yeah. what He's done. Yeah. Amen? And I'm not saying you can't walk closer with the Lord because the reality of it is, is that that would not be true. The Word of God says, you, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. He's looking for a heart that will draw near to Him. And we don't do it enough, Lord. Or I don't do it enough. Help us! Make us hungry for your presence, Lord. Yeah. There's nothing better than being in the presence yeah. of God. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. There's nothing better than the victory of God. All right, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we'll go ahead and start at verse 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, would shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, your servants for, for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I feel the Holy Spirit on that. Yeah. We have this treasure. I walked in this morning and they were singing a song and it said treasure. I said, there you go again, Lord. <laughs> we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. This morning I titled this message, look, I just finally, finally finished reading the scripture. We're about to get into, we're about to get into the intro, y'all ready? <laughs> the, this morning's title is Just a Vessel. Just a Vessel, Amen. And to make, Father, in the name of Jesus, once again, I humbly come to you and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would articulate your word this morning. That you would show up and that you'd give us revelation, Lord God, about this word, about this passage. That you would speak what you've put on my heart, Lord God. But that more importantly, Lord, you would give us revelation of yes, it, Lord. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the main thought of this passage refers to the important ministry of presenting the gospel. Amen. Amen. I already explained that. Of Jesus Christ. Paul devoted his whole life to this endeavor. And unlike others, he's not going to present it in a in an improper way. He's not going to do it crooked or perverse. He's not going to hide stuff. No, he's just going to let the word of God preach. Amen. He's not in it for greedy gain. He truly wants to see the power and beauty of what God is offering, and he wants the people to see the beauty and the power of what God is is offering them. I chose the title just a vessel not to belittle the great work of the Apostle Paul nor to belittle the gifts of the ministry that Jesus has given to the church and the apostle, evangelist, pastor, prophet, pastor, or teacher. No, but instead I chose the title just a vessel to make the very point that Paul was making, which was the work of God. It's by him and for him. So what is the work of God? I wanted to ask you that question this morning. And you, listen, you could come up with so many different thoughts in your mind. Could you not? I tried to condense it down to one phrase. Now, listen, if I don't hit every aspect of what the word of God is, what work of God is to you, please forgive me. I tried to condense it down into one phrase. I would say that if I had to sum it up in one phrase, the work of God is exposing the love of God. By presenting his word to a lost and dying world. The work of God is to present the love of God through the communication of his word to a lost and a dying world. But listen, there are a lot of ways to define the word expose. I mean, you could expose someone on Facebook. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, this part of the definition, to present to view, to put on exhibition, to put something on display. Your preacher's preaching ought to elevate and exalt 
Jesus. Yeah. Amen. If they you can't say nothing else, I hope that you can at least agree. Listen to me. That preacher got a whole lot of issues that I don't like. That's fine if you feel that way. But listen, I hope you can say about my preaching that it elevates and it exposes and it talks about the beauty of Jesus. That's all I ever want to do when it comes to the Word of God. Lord, help me in every aspect of my life. But when it comes to present your Word, I pray that you would be exalted and put on full view for the world to see. Amen. Amen. Some people act like God's love doesn't need exposure or explanation. Come on. I mean, listen, I've gone out on the street and I've ministered to a lot of people. They're like, oh, I'm a Christian. I go to church and I'm thinking, I, I don't say it all the time. Every now and then that the Lord leads me. I'm like, well, good then. You ought to be happy about this. It's full of the word of God. You ought to read it. But it's like, oh, no, you got it all figured out, huh? No. The love of God needs some explanation, folks. We ain't got it all figured out. Most people believe that they already have a revelation of the love of God. But the reality is that many in the church and most of the world are blind to the depth of God's love. Blind to the deeper truths of the gospel in general. And that brings me to point number one. Point number one. The light of the gospel opens blinded eyes. Amen? Amen. The light of the gospel opens blinded eyes. Look back at verse 4 for me in 2 Corinthians 4. And let's remind ourselves what we've already talked about. In whom the God of this world. You know, he's talking about the devil. The God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Do you realize that everything that the enemy is doing, and I know I've already explained it a little bit, is trying to blind the eyes of the world and blind the eyes of the church. Why? Because if the light of the glorious gospel was revealed to them, what would happen? They would begin to be set free. They would begin to be set free from bondage, free from misery, free from sin. The weight that has held them down and has tormented them would be will be released, they would begin to walk in freedom and in liberty. And they would be so excited that God showed up for them that guess what would happen? The love of God manifesting them would come flowing out of them. I'm not saying everybody get on a street corner with a megaphone, but what I am saying is, is this, is that the love of God would flow out of yeah. them. They might just whisper it to somebody. They might just give an old friend of theirs a hug and just some. I'm praying for you. The Lord, I know you, I know you used to you knew know me when I was like this, but now the Lord has done a work in my life. I don't live the way I used to live. I don't do the things I used to do because God has reached down and changed me. And I just want you to know, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God, that you get a revelation of the love of God. But in the meantime, the enemy, the God of this world, he wants to keep people's eyes blind to it. Satan works hard to deceive people from the truth of God's word, which ultimately reveals God's love. It's important to really stop and ponder this verse for a moment. The thought is that, number one, there are those that are lost in this verse, right? They are blinded, and the God of this world has developed some kind of way to blind them. Ultimately, they cannot see what needs to be seen. I would ask the church to think and answer today. Do we think that the blinded minds, and I know I've already said this, refer here only represent those that have rejected Jesus? No, I don't believe that. Or is it possible that the lost can include a majority portion of what we call the church today? Let me just show you some, some things about some scriptures. We're going to just flash them up there real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. We're talking about people being blinded. And that it's not just the world, but that it's also the church. Look at 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they, who's they? That's talking about people that would even care about the Bible. When they will not endure sound doctrine. Listen, folks, we're there. <laughs> Can I tell you that? I don't want to have, I don't have time to, to beat this horse. We are there. They will not endure sound doctrine, but look at this. After their own lusts. It's what they want. That's what the word lust means. The, the, the word lust literally means epithumia, and it describes a deep de desire for something. Sometimes the word can actually be used in a positive way. You can have a lust for the presence of God. If it's, uh, That English word doesn't work well, but the Greek word works. You can have an epithumia for the presence of God. That's used in a good context. But guess what? When it's talking about bad stuff, they have a lust for their own desires. 
Sometimes it's not, I'm not trying to be weird, it's not drugs, it's not alcohol, it's not in illicit relationships, it's not that. Sometimes it's, I got a lust to hear what I want to hear. I got a lust to be told things about the Bible and to believe the way that I want to about the church. I want, this is how I want to believe about the gospel. I don't like the way that preacher is saying that this is the way the gospel looks. It's not about the preacher, it's about the word. That's right. What it says, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know what it's describing? Piles of teachers. I got a pile over here. I got a pile over here. I got a pile over here. I got all these little teachers that I use. Some of them I find on TV. Some of them I find over here. Oh, Lord, help me to do your will. And that I don't just start calling people's names just to do it because I know I'm not scared to, but I don't want to be in the flesh. I got just little piles of teachers because you know what? I got an itchy ear, but when you look it up in the Greek, you know what it means? It opens and I'm like, see, see, I got a dog now. I love that dog. And sometimes I dog, dude, there's number here. When I rub that dog's belly, it's like, it kind of move her paw like that. But that's not what I was talking about. I was talking about pleasant words. They want to hear pleasant words. Yeah. If you give me a word that doesn't make me feel pleasant, if I don't get pleasure out of it, if you're not making me feel good, how many conversations have I been in with people that say they love the Lord? Called me up asked me questions, and then when I told them that what I felt like to be the truth, I just believed that when you go to church, or you talk to somebody about the Lord, you're supposed to feel good about yourself when you know, whoa, hold on a second, you never saw the time that Jesus rebuked folk? I had one dude have the audacity to tell me, oh, you're misinterpreting that. I'm like, dude, Jesus flipped the table, took a whip, and drove them out. Oh, uh, that, that, you're, I don't, I don't, I never, that, I don't believe that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you interpret it your way. Anyway, look at the next verse. And they shall, and, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. Listen to me. You don't get confused and think that we're talking about David Koresh. Don't think that we get confused and think that we're talking about people that we don't necessarily know the names of these people. I'm not going to start talking about, because it's been a while since I've done this research, so I don't want to just start naming names and say the wrong thing. But I'm pretty sure that there's this particular woman who is so extremely pop. I'm pretty sure it's her. I'm, I just There's two different women that were very popular recently. And I'm pretty sure it's the one I'm thinking of. And when I drive down the road, they got her simulcast and like everybody's paying money and she's being broadcast all over the church world. And women are flocking in churches to watch her on a TV as she teaches, all right? And, and, and you know, you might be able to figure out who it is. I'm pretty sure it was her. And if anybody, y'all know what I'm talking about, what I'm about to say, and so if I'm wrong, you can just shake your head, no. That was connected herself with people that were teaching this concept called contemplative prayer. Now, contemplative prayer, I'm not, I hadn't talked about this in forever, and I don't even really know why I am, because I just want you to understand something, that everything in the church, people are naive. Contemplative prayer is a remake uh, of, of Eastern meditation. It's kind of like the way that, and, and listen, this has all been in the Catholic Church. This is Ignatius Loyola and all his steps in trying to teach people all of this meditative type practice. This is not Christianity. This is not the Christianity of the Bible. This is like a mixture of Buddhism and a mixture of Christi uh, uh, trying to mix Christianity with Buddhism. There ain't no such animal, folks. No, that's right. The Buddha didn't die for nobody. Right. But this stuff is rampant in the church. And these people are being being embraced and pastors because she's popular and everybody's all about her we'll just go ahead and let everybody but no preacher you're allowing your own people to be exposed to things she may not be coming out and say okay let's practice contemplative prayer right now she might not be doing that on the video but listen at some point in time they're going to be mentioning things and just little little pieces here a little bit of leaven here what did Jesus say a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. You can't put a little bit of yeast and not expect it to take up. For that's the nature of yeast. That's the nature of false doctrine. That's the nature of sin. It takes over. 
contemplative prayer. And it's like, you know, what they would, they would teach is, is this, is that what you do is, and, and it would even sound okay. Because see, this is what Eastern meditation teaches. You find you that one word. It's called a mantra, right? And you just, whatever it is, don't even have to be a word. You can just be, I don't, I'm not trying to be weird. Lord, please forgive me. I'm not doing anything wrong here. I'm just trying to give you an example. It's like, no, 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 own own the little own things that they do. Well, their whole point to all of that is, is that you're so focused on the own, when you're so focused on the on the chatter, blah, 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 whatever it is you're doing, that you're emptying your mind. So there's no focal point. You're emptying your mind. You start to focus on that own thing. And you're doing and you're doing this to the point where then you forget that you're even doing the own thing. You empty your mind. Now what you're doing is you're opening yourself up for something else to come in. That's why people, whenever they do that deep form of yoga, they say, oh my gosh, I felt the greatest peace. That's a lie of the devil, folks. I don't want to, I could get into so much more right now. Do you realize that people, that the devil will lie to people and tell them that if they will do crazy things, stuff that is not good for them, and still they will feel a peace for a moment in time. Oh, yeah. Satan is a liar. He'll give you like a little momentary piece of peace so that he can later show up and cause more destruction and more lies in your life till he finally strings you along to the end. Anyway, they want you to own, and they'll even tell you, oh no, you, this is what you're going to do. In contemplative prayer, we're going to mix the two together. We're going to say, Jesus. Boy, doesn't that sound right? Yep. But instead of you doing the right kind of meditation, see, the word of New Testament meditation is whenever I tell you meditate on the Lord, I'm not trying to tell you to be like, Jesus, 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 right. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> so I empty my mind. No, meditate on what the word of God says. That in the end days, some are going to depart from the faith and they're going to give heed to seducing spirits. Meditate on that. Chew on that. Think about that. Don't heap to yourselves, preachers, because you have an ear that wants to hear pleasant words. You need to chew on that, child of God. You need to be aware that your enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Lord, help us. He wants to destroy us. That's a Christian meditation. Not that other stuff. That's a lie. You play around with that. Go on. Lord, help us. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. That is witchcraft. It's just repackaged and it's got another name. You ain't playing with something of the Lord right there. Let me tell you, man, look. There's all kinds of forms of that stuff, too. I'm talking about the spiritual aspect of, of that yoga stuff, too, man. Spiritual aspect of it. Now, I'm all about yoga stretching. But look, whenever they start oming and doing all this other kind of stuff, I'm like, dude, you leave me out of that. Let me, let me tell you something, though. Well, I don't have time for that. Aleister Crowley was a, the, yes. the most powerful black magic practitioner. Yes. I've studied all this stuff. When he went to the Tibetan mountains to meet up with one of his old friends, he was already like doing human sacrifice by this time. He showed up in a room of his friend that was practicing this kundalini yoga stuff. And I'm just telling you what Aleister Crowley said. I mean, he's a liar like his father, so you can't believe anything. He said that dude was levitated 10 feet off the ground. He's like, dude, I got to tap into this. All I'm trying to tell you is, is that we're playing with a power that is not of the Lord. Amen. And yeah, granted, you got to really get deep in <clears> stuff <throat> to, be, to be doing all that. But my point is, why you won't mess with that to be done with? Amen. Lord, help. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. <laughs> Beloved, believe not every spirit. That's right. When you're flipping through the channels and you see the crowd filled with people and everybody got that big old smile on their face. Don't believe every spirit. You better try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. I wish I had more time to spend there, but I'm not going to do it. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30. We already covered this here recently. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to the, all the flock. He's talking to the leaders of Ephesus. He's going his way back to Jerusalem, Paul is. Over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Oh, man. You are the flock of God. You belong to God. He purchased you with his own blood. Amen. And Jesus doesn't take kindly to preachers standing up behind the pulpit and mishandling his word and speaking lies to his people. Look at the next verse. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Listen to me. You ain't going to find somebody up here preaching grievous words like a wolf because the first time that they do it, they ain't never going to do it again. 
But but let me tell you this. Ain't nobody can control where you're putting on your TV. I'm just telling you right now. 99.9%, and I said it, and if you want to talk to me after, that's fine, of what you're going to find on television is not going to be of the Lord. Amen. I'm not saying you ain't ever going to hear nobody say a scripture. Okay, you get the point I'm trying to make. Amen. Sin blinds the eyes and it hardens the heart towards a revelation of God's word. At the same time, the deception of Satan works overtime to make sure that he's doing his part to prevent us from seeing what we should see. It's true that sin and deception have a way of wearing on a person's heart. But listen, this is good news. Through the many years of painful circumstance, the blindest of eyes and the hardest of hearts become willing to cry out from help from the Lord. I had a story in here about blind Bartimaeus. I'm not going to go there to read it, but I'll tell you it's in Mark 10, 46 through 52. And if you remember the story, Jesus and a whole crowd was behind him, was on his way to Jericho. And there was a couple of blind men. And blind Bartimaeus heard through the rustling of the crowd that it was Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth was there. And when he heard it, he was just... The Bible says that his name was blind Bartimaeus. He was the son of Timaeus. And he was sitting there, and he couldn't he see anything, but he got to hear it. He said, oh, it's Jesus. It's, it's that guy, Jesus. And all of a sudden, he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I mean, this was what he was waiting for. He had been blind. He had been miserable. He had been a beggar on the side of the road. He was tired of his situation. He was tired of his circumstance. Yes. And then the disciples were like, oh, no, hold your peace. No, dude, you're making us feel awkward. You don't look the part. We don't like your clothes. We don't like the way you look. Please. He's the master. <laughs> you don't have a right to touch him. Stop it. You know what it says? Cried out all the more. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus said, no, you don't stop him. You let him come to me. And whenever they told him, he said, okay, the master will see you. The Bible says he took his garment, he flung it to the side. Oh, that's so good. And Jesus said, will you receive your sight today? He walked away seeing that day. I know we're talking about physical sight, but listen to me. The Bible, when it talks about his garment, the, 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 the history of the church will teach us, or history of that time will teach us that they, they were allowed a garment. It was like a beggar's garment. It showed society, that this, this is legit, he can sit here and he can beg. He, it's like it was his life. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Don't be confused by the devil. I mean, yeah, you can love the Lord, but guess what? You're going to serve the Lord? If you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to be like Brian Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. You're going to take that old garment of who you used to be. You're going to fling it to the side, and you're going to embrace Jesus. And you're going to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I wanted him to hold his peace. People don't like it when you're tired of being blind and want to do something about it. Oh. They, they, nobody wants to let you go, man. Wow. I wish I, I ain't got to out even preach this whole message. I wish, I wish I could tell you, people in the world are so uncomfortable when you, like blind Bartimaeus, take your cloak, chunk it to the side, stand up, and start walking with the Lord. They ain't about to let you do that without giving you a hard time. You have to make a choice. I always tell that story about how my old friends from Lafayette came and, hey, dude, we're on our way. I was just saved fresh, maybe four months. We're on our way. Mike's parents are out of town at home, and we're going to party. Come on. And look, man, I did some bad. I did, you know, I say bad. I mean, whatever. I did a whole lot worse, but the next day, I was so convinced. Dude, I wish the Holy Spirit, listen, you got to be careful when the conviction power of the Holy Spirit will start to wear off on you because you can let your conscience come seared like a hot iron. That day I was so convicted. I was like, dude, y'all got to take me home. What? I'm like, yeah, I'm different. Y'all got to take me home. And in that car, I know I've told y'all this story before, but they were like talking to each other. Man, remember that dude, Matt? They called me Fat. Fat Matt. Fat Matt the River Rat. You remember Fat, how cool that dude was? <laughs> Man, that dude was so fun to party with. Even when I wasn't fat, they still called me fat. That dude was so fun to party with. What happened to that guy? I'm like, man, y'all can say whatever y'all want. 
I'm different. The world ain't going to want to let you live it down. But guess what? God will be by your side each and every moment and of the way. Amen. And sooner or later, we just got to come to the place like blind board of man is where we want it. That's part of my message. Lord, help us. Help us. You know, the Lord kind of gave me these, these messages right here. But when we're talking about blindness, and I talked about it today, what I wrote. When I say cross today, I'm not talking just about initial salvation. No, I'm talking about my daily walk with God. I feel like I at least got to finish this morning's message with that. I had two more points to go. We're not going to get there. But let me just give you these scriptures that I felt like the Lord put on my heart regarding that right there. Because listen, people in the church are blind to the proper pathway towards victory with yes. the Lord. Okay, y'all yes. ready? All right, here we go. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. Colossians 2, verses 6 through 7. Look what it says. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord... So walk ye in him. Before we move to the next verse, I want to ask you a question. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not rhetorical. I want you to think about it. You ain't got to shout it out, but if you want to, you can. How did you receive the Lord when you got saved? How did you do that? Through faith. Through faith in what? Well, you might not have understood it, but through faith in him, right? Because he's the promised one that the prophets told us was coming. And he's the fulfillment of that promise. And what he did. He didn't have faith in his good preaching ability. Because that, don't, that right there by itself. Listen, none, that didn't save anybody. No, it, you had faith in the fact you were a sinner, but he was the answer for your sin. How was he the answer for your sin? Because he died on the cross. He paid the penalty for sin. Amen. No, no, he redeemed us from the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it might have been real simple when you believed. I can remember the first time. I know I share it all the time, but when I was in that crowd and that preacher was saying, the blood, the blood, and I was so uncomfortable. I was like, why that woman keep talking about the blood? And then she said it. She said, the innocent one died in place of the guilty one. And listen to me. Somebody in this place, the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart. You better get up here and give your life to Jesus. And I ran up there, boy, and I was like, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. I knew I was a sinner. He didn't have to spell that out. I knew it wasn't right. And I knew Jesus was the answer that I needed. I just had to surrender. Hallelujah. And dude, when I surrendered that day, guess what? Boom! The weight fell off. I didn't understand all this stuff I'm talking to you about today. But in order to walk with the Lord, you got to learn some stuff, Amen. brothers and sisters. The enemy will try to blind you to knowing the truth. All right. Look at the next verse. <clears throat> Rooted and built up in Him. See, we need a root system. I've shared this a lot, but it's just too good to give up. <laughs> when they were built, you remember whenever they added property over there by the lake and they built those cabins? And they actually took, like, I think a dredge and they threw all that silt up there. And then one day they had some stuff growing. And I, my mom probably don't even remember, but I asked her, I said, I said, what kind of plants are those? Because my mama knows all kinds of stuff about plants and stuff. She's like, I don't know, Matthew. I said, why do you think they did that? I don't know, probably to build some kind of intricate root system. Dude, that's so good. <laughs> An intricate root system prevents erosion. When you're rooted in the faith, when that seed of the gospel lands in good soil of your heart. Now, I'm preaching the gospel right now. I know that I'm talking about a little plant that was out there by the park. But I'm saying, when the seed of the gospel takes root in your heart, it will begin to be, you got to be rooted and established in the faith. So that when trial and tribulation and persecution comes, you don't just wither away when the sun starts to shine on your little seedling. You need to be rooted and established in the faith as you have been taught. Yes. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. thanksgiving. So when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, that's how you got to walk in Him. You got to be rooted and established. Yes. You got to start learning. You need to know what the object of your faith is. Amen. Amen. It ain't in you and what you do. Amen. It's in Him and what He did. That's good Amen. preaching right there. Amen. It just takes everything out. It just it just takes all our right. For 
the righteousnesses of a man are like filthy rags. Yes. It's because of the motivation of the heart. Yes. God wants us to work. That's really what my message was about. It was about being a vessel. I think I'm going to finish this message one day. <laughs> look, at, look at Romans chapter 3 verses 22 through 24. I promise you I'm not going to try to finish it today. <laughs> look at this. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. I'm talking about the same way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. I'm trying to give you scripturally the way the Holy Spirit flows in the life of the believer to give him victory. I'm talking about righteousness right now because let me tell you something. This is the hinge point of the gospel. Mankind born of Adam is not righteous. He's guilty and he's condemned. But because of what Jesus did, now there can be a change. Look, I'm not going to go there, but in Romans 5, 17, it, Romans 5 talks about a gift five different times. And you know what that gift is? Righteousness. It's a gift of God. It's a gift that Jesus gave to you. Jesus was the only human being that had righteousness inherent in him. What he did was he died on the cross so that an exchange could take place so that you could be given the gift of his righteousness. Amen. I used to have some cloaks back there. One of them was white if I had it, but it'd take too long to do it. And I used to throw it on myself to make the illustration. That's what imputed righteousness is. A covering, a gift. That's the plan of the Father, to give you the righteousness of Jesus. <laughs> you got to get off all this stuff in your mind. I'm the darling of heaven. I'm the one that gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm the one seeking the face of God. Ain't nobody doing what I'm doing. I'm righteous. No, no. I'm pleased in Him. When you allow yourself to be submitted in Him, now I can be pleased with you. Now I can do some work in you. Now I can do some work through you. <laughs> He's the righteousness of God. That's what that text is talking about. If you go to the verse before, it's talking about the righteousness of God apart from the law is now manifest. Jesus is the right, the manifestation of God's righteousness. Amen. But look, whenever you, so it's faith of Jesus Christ. Look at that. That's the, that's the trick. Faith in Christ allows his righteousness to be given to those that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know what the word justified means? I know I've taught that many times. It means a declaration of righteousness. It means when you put faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit could just bear with me. We've got two more scriptures. Okay, I'll, I'll cut this thing short. I'll just work with me. All right? Whenever you got saved and the Holy Spirit can guess what happened? The, the Father put the righteousness of Jesus on you, and because now you're righteous and you're not guilty, I'm about to get to it, the Holy Spirit was allowed to move into you. You don't understand all this maybe, but that's what the Bible teaches. He moved into you not once, I know I'm beating this up and I'm not trying to make y'all feel bad. It's not because you were the darling of heaven. <laughs> no, Jesus was. It's because you were willing to believe the plan of the Father. <laughs> Praise God. It's through faith. Look at, go back to, again to the last verse. For all of sin, uh, the other verse. Look at this. For even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. This righteousness of God comes through the agency of faith, faith of Christ, and then and, and it's given to you, and it's given to all of them that believe. So now you have, and then when you go down to the justified part, you've been justified freely by His grace. The free gift of righteousness. Once again, listen, I don't have time to write it out for you. I've done it before. The word righteousness in the Greek and justified in the Greek are so close. There's only two Greek letters that separate it. Because justified is just a declaration of what's already happened in the spirit. When you got saved and God gave you the standing of righteousness, it's as though God is declaring that to be true. No matter what any man says... No matter what anybody tries to tell you. Oh, yeah, but sister. God says, if your faith is in my son, I see you as righteous. Amen. That's a good word. Because let me tell you something. When you start to give a rev revelation of that, because the devil don't want you. He wants to blind your eyes to that. That's right. You hear what I'm trying to tell you? He wants to blind your eyes to that. He wants to say, oh, no, you're not. I remember what we did last night, boo. I remember what we did last week. Oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. No, 
tell you not. No. I'm telling you what the Bible says. Yeah. The Bible says if your faith is in Christ for what he for, for your sin and you put faith in what he did for you on the cross, then the great exchange took place. Right. He took your guilt, he gave you his right hand. When you start to believe that, guess what's going to happen? I'm telling you right now, I've experienced it. All of a sudden, yes. an overwhelming thankfulness to God. Oh, Lord, let, 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 Holy Spirit, we need a revelation. Yes, amen. Because Matt can't talk him into it. Okay, I'm weak. It. There has to be a connection that takes Amen. place between my mouth and your heart and between the Holy Spirit. Because if the Holy Spirit will give you a revelation of this, I'm telling you right now, if your eyes would be open in the Spirit to what I'm trying to tell you, your heart would be so overwhelmed yes. with the goodness of God. That the freedom and liberty of the Holy Spirit yes. would well up on the inside of you. And you'd be like, oh my God, how could I have ever done that to you, Lord? How could have I ever? And I'm not, I'm not talking as a man. I'm talking to you. I'm talking as a man. I'm talking as a man that has experienced it. How could I have ever done that to you, Lord? Even after I knew you. But then the scripture would say, but while you were yet a sinner, I died for the ungodly. Listen, God has a way of revealing truth to you and I. I'll say it in a way, if I'm not careful, that'll hurt you. But the Holy Spirit, he'll be, he can speak the harshest yes. of things, but it's covered with his love. Yeah, yeah, and he does yeah. nothing but heal. He ain't tearing you down. He's building you up. Amen. He's building you up and he's filling you up and he's healing you. He's making you a Oh, we need a revelation. Holy Spirit, we need a revelation Amen. of what it means to be justified. But look at this. Next scripture. I'm, I'm kind of working through on you. Right? I'm working through. As you received him by faith, so shall you walk in him. When you received him by faith, the Father said you were righteous. Once the Father made you righteous, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Look, it's a step. No, all this happened immediately. You understand what I'm saying? At one moment in the, like, I know the rapture, like the twinkling of an eye, all this happened. Boom! I'm just, it takes me forever to get it out because I'm a man. You, you understand what I'm trying to get at? Yeah. Look at this, Ephesians 1.13. In whom you also trusted. Who'd you trust in? Jesus. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. Thank God for a preacher that told you the truth yes. or a witness that told you the truth. And when you heard it and you trusted in it, look what happened. It was the gospel of your salvation in whom also after you believe, look at this, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Oh, man, that's a good one. Right there. Yes. It's got more to say, but look, basically what I'm trying to tell you is this. As you received the Lord, had you receive him through faith, not just in what he, in who he was, but also in what he did. And when you did that... You were placed, the righteousness of God was placed upon you. Amen. And when the righteousness of God was placed upon you, guess what? The Holy Spirit came to live in you. Yes. Don't let the devil lie to you. But you don't know where I've been, preacher. After my sister took her life, Things got so bad for me for a period of time that I hadn't been in a bar room in 12 years. You know what? That don't mean nothing because I was drinking quarts of beer in the backyard looking at pornography. So why not just go to you soon, dude? You're nothing but a religious hypocrite. I'm just being real with you. People in the church are bound up and they're trying to hide it because it's scared because everybody's going to blast them. People are bound up. The God of this world wants to blind your eyes. That's who I was. That's where I was. And that day, I felt like it was all done, and I was giving up. Not because God wasn't good. I even told, I told my wife. She didn't know where I was. I wasn't going to tell her where I was. And I was on the phone, and I said, you know what? I quit, and I hung up. And I can remember thinking later that I wasn't quitting because I didn't love the Lord. I was quitting because I kept failing God. And I was so tired of failing God. And I remember whenever I was, when I was in that in that bar room and I was in that bathroom and the Lord spoke to me. I don't have time to really go through all what he said. I've said it before, but he spoke to me. And the next day I said, Lord, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to. I mean, I didn't even know any of what I'm telling you about in the scripture, but it was the same thing I'm telling you in the scripture. Yeah. I said, you're going to have to do it because I can't do it. Right. Yeah. It's the same thing. I had to become dependent on the Lord. Yeah, right. You're going to have to do it because I can't do it. Yes. Yes, 
And for about two weeks later, all like only the Holy Spirit could do, the Lord said, they told you that I'd never show up in a place like you drugged me in that urine-smelling bathroom. But I never left you. The devil was trying to tell you that I wasn't there, but I was there. Right. It's just that you had become heart of heart, and you were far from me, and you couldn't hear me, and you couldn't feel me anymore, but I was there. I never left you. That's right. I never forsook you. I was there the whole time. I'd go in there with you. I'd go into the deepest, darkest places with you because I love you, and I'm never going to give up on you. That's it. And I just need you to understand that. And it was when I got a revelation of that. The love of Jesus. Amen. I was like, man, he's so good. Yes. I've been far from perfect since then, church, but I'm going to tell you something right now. Yes. I don't want to go back. What I, what they got for me out there? Oh. Bunch of heartache, bunch of pain, yes. bunch of loss. Yes. Amen. When you keep faith in Christ, listen to me, I'm not just talking about for your salvation daily. So Amen. the way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. You maintain a position of righteousness through faith. As you maintain that position of righteousness, guess what's happening? Holy Spirit's flowing. The Holy Spirit's flowing in you. It's no longer you having to beat the devil. It's the Lord going to work for you. The strong man bound in that moment of time of your life. Moment to moment, day to day, walking with the Lord. Yes, amen. Keeping your faith focused in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Your flesh wants to take you out of that spot. That's right. This don't work if you don't surrender. That's right. He ain't going to transgress your free will. He gave that to you as a gift too. Because yeah. he ain't one looking for a bunch of robots. That's good. That's he good. wants to be loved. He wants you to love him. Oh, he's proven his love. He not emptied up heaven and put Jesus on the cross hanging naked in the noonday sun. He's proved his love. Amen. He wants our love. And he don't expect you to have to do it all on your own. Right. He wants to do it for you. He wants to get you through this thing. But you're going to have to want it. Yes. Galatians 2.20. Because see that old man? He wants to live. Yes. I'm not even going to. I'm not even going to. I'm just going to quote it. Look. The old man that you were born of Adam died with Jesus. You've been crucified with Jesus. Amen. Amen. This is part of that process, and daily I gotta stay there, right? I'm not gonna go there too. I'm not gonna go there too much because I, I gotta feel it. All right, Galatians chapter six, verse fourteen. <coughs> but God forbid. Listen, I'm talking. Talk, I'm this. I'm closing with this. I'm talking about daily. See, because because there's a trial of your life. There's a trial of your faith. There's a test Amen. of your faith Amen. every single yes. day. That's right. Yvette, could you come and get your guitar? And every single day. The world is going to pull you. Sin is going to try to pull you. Yeah. <clears throat> the enemy wants your flesh to live. Our part is faith and surrender. It don't work if we don't surrender. Yeah. No, this is the simplicity of the gospel. Yeah. Jesus already did it. He said, it is finished. The powers of hell have been made an open display of. They've been mocked in the spiritual realm. They've been defeated in the spiritual realm through what Jesus did at the cross. It is a finished work. It is a done work. But guess what? We got to continue to believe and we got to continue to surrender. Yes. Lord, help our flesh. Look what it says. Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Listen, I need the Lord to crucify the world and the desires of the world in my heart because if the Lord doesn't crucify that stuff, I'm going to be right back where I was before.